Please. Do you want to grab that for me? Paper towels in here so I can wipe my under tits. Oh, that's a little ridiculous. Um, I have a shirt. Uh, <laughs> I can wipe my under with your shirt. That's the best I can do. For All right, screw it. I'm over it. Okay. Let's I, could, I could use this mask. Ugh. I'm the kind of guy that if I use this to wipe my under boob, I would then put it on my face afterwards without remembering. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't judge you. The millions of people that are going to watch this podcast might judge you, but. You can rest assured that for sure I wouldn't. Okay. Oh, sure. Where right. it's going? Okay. The problem is less judgment than it is my own disgust upon realizing that I'm inhaling my underboot vapors. Right. Oh, God. People who don't live in New York really don't know what it's like. This place is a goddamn heat trap. It's humid as hell. It gets super hot. It's nothing but blacktop. It just absorbs the heat. And you get these ridiculous... And all the alleys between these tall buildings just become micro. Right. Well, and it snows too. It does, but it does snow. The range of temperatures it gets here is, it gets so hot you're going to die outside potentially. And then you're freezing cold down it, to your bones. And it gets so hot that you actually might you might freeze to death. It's brutal. It's horrible. It's a lot. It's too much. I would say. I don't understand. I, I guess I do understand why people live here, but I'm not really. I mean, I think uh, I think like many New Yorkers, I think like many New Yorkers, I just uh, I wound up here. Right. Or I, I just take it for granted. Uh, because I've always lived here and things like that, but it is a bit of a rough choice. It's for a very particular kind of person, I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, How's it look? Does it look good? Does it look good? It looks kind of dark. It does look a little dark. Do you want to do you want to fix that for me? Let's see. Where's your? It's uh the there's a uh, the, a wheel down on the bottom left. Yeah, that wheel. What's changing? I think is it's... that the? No, that's not making it better. Well, not but I was blowing out. Yeah. That's 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 fine. I think that's good. Maybe we need to turn a light on in here. Um, we could make that happen. Uh, do you want to hand me that? This? Uh, no, no, the uh, that wire attached to that light bulb. Oh, no, no, no uh, not not the light bulb itself. But the, geez, ruining everything. It's very specific. Um, so this is, this plugs into my. Uh, Yeah, maybe needs to go on your side. Potentially. You want it? Sure. No, we can't. Jeez. I thought you were a professional YouTuber, oh. Steven. Uh, I think that's the best that I'm willing to, best that I'm willing to do. Not the best that I can do. I think got a little variety here. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it is backlit, so, yeah. How do I look? Do I have light on? It's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you look uh, like the most handsome man on the planet. Mm. There's one I haven't even heard from my wife. It's nice. That feels good. Yeah. And how are you on charge? You got all your stuff uh, done? So, here. Well, do you want to look at this to see, do you want to try and finagle your way? <laughs> in the most uncomfortable like Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. Oh, okay. Does it look what am I supposed does, to look does does it look like we're looks framed good. well? Okay, cool. Yeah, looks Sounds good. Let's do that. <sighs> nice. I did it. We did it. That tripled the amount that I'm sweating. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> well I appreciate you doing this. It is I appreciate you having it. It's absurdly hot. It's uh, could you tell people where we are? We are in Sunnyside, New York City. Yeah. Sunnyside, Queens. Uh, it's very hot here. If you couldn't tell, we are parked on the street right now. Yep. Um, in the middle of Brooklyn, or Queens. In the middle of Queens, a train is going by. Uh, cars are passing us. This um, is not going to be the cleanest audio anyone's ever no, heard. No, it's not. But that's, again, part of the experience. I think it raises above ambient and becomes dominant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Obnoxious is probably a... But that's how we live. So yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I'm there. Yeah. 
very loud. It is very loud. I, honestly, I like this kind of stuff. I like the fact that it's like kind of raw. It would be unpleasant to listen to this as just a piece of thing, like while I was working. You know? Right, yeah. You're hearing a motorcycle and a train. Um, and uh, there might be some people screaming outside at some point. There's going to be some amount of that. Yeah, yeah. Dogs barking, cats yeah. howling. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We'll um, just have to make the uh, content, the words, interesting enough to uh, compensate. Absolutely. The, they won't be able to tear themselves away. They'll have to deal with the train screeching. Yeah. It's not even like a classic like train rumble. It's a screech. And it, it, it's been going on for like two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Long two-minute break yeah. of, a, of a train. Yeah. 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 All right, Christian. Um, no. Well, do you, what do you usually do here? Uh, well, I, I guess I always start with telling people the point of this, even though it's called the Sketchy Van Podcast, is not to talk about technique or how to draw perspective or how to draw anatomy or any of that kind of stuff. Oh my God, I'm utterly uninterested. Well, yeah, yeah, you, you hate that stuff, right? <laughs> well, it's more about like the why. You know, the yeah. thing that I've been thinking about is like, um, like I, I'm around some of what I consider the best art teachers alive right now, and even that doesn't motivate me to want to do art all the time you know and i found that having a why to do things is way more motivating than just having a wealth of knowledge around me at all times you know having a context for it you know and i I mean when i look at somebody like you i see somebody who loves art to a point to where it has affected the amount of money you have potentially or it has affected your life in a lot of ways and it's been worth it for you you know um, and I'm always curious about that with people. It's like, how do you find meaning out of something that is objectively, you know, like rubbing a piece of graphite on a piece of wood, you know? Yeah. Um, like Profound when, questions, Christian. Profound yeah. questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and art does... It's weird to say that art has affected my life or made an impact on my life at this point, um, which has been both good and bad. It's had positive effects and negative effects. Right. But... Um, at this point, it kind of really does define my life. Yeah, it's diff- it's weird to say that it has impacted my life. I right. I, I try to um, I try to have like a a more balanced view a lot of the times where it's like I'm not just that. That's not really the whole definition. You know, I have my friends and my wife and my dog, and I'm a son to someone and a brother yeah. to someone and all of that. And all of that is true. And I think on my good days, that's where I live from. Right. But if I'm perfectly honest, art really. It has its, it has its talons in me, and it yeah. really is sort of the substrate from which everything else arises. And right. Just so many of my conversations in life are about it. So much of the help that I offer other human beings right. is about it. That it really just feels, yeah, really, it's more than it has an impact on me. It really is my life. It's kind of who you are, right? Yeah, which is dangerous. Right. That's a dangerous thing because art is so capricious and ever changing and very right. hard to predict and control. That's a dangerous thing to do, I think. Yeah. Well, I, we were talking about free will before we started this conversation. And I've been thinking a lot about the idea where I wish I actually didn't care about art that much. You know, I wish I got as much validation from selling real estate or being a banker or, you know, doing things that are more financially rewarding uh, than art because it's like objectively that's going to have a better like a better effect on my life. You know? Yeah. Um, and observing in myself that that's something I wish I cared more about and actually not being able to is a very strange thing to observe in myself, you know? Yes. Um, like, I would rather live in this van and drive around the country and be super hot all the time and be uncomfortable than be working at an insurance company, um, selling insurance and living in an apartment and having, com- like, a comfortable life, you know? Right. Um, and... Uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not thankful for, for what I'm doing right now. I think it's an incredible experience, but mm-hmm. I also think that it can be somewhat of a curse to be so into something that you're willing to give your entire life to. Yep. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, if you don't mind me being just, I love conversation like this because this is always an opportunity for me to just be like right. completely candid. I do try to always be completely candid, like even on my YouTube yeah. channel and things like that, but it's just the nature of having an audience grow or getting more narrowed into a brand or something that you just you find less and less reason to sort of diverge a lot of the time but conversations like this people like you uh, uh, in sort of like not my area this is my chance to really be completely candid with a lot of this stuff so that exactly what you said uh, I just got back from a trip to Italy with my wife we had a conversation over dinner 
um, or I was expressing basically that exact same sentiment. The way that I put it is that, like, at, there's definitely been points um, where if I could take a pill, that if I took it, it would make me want to invest the amount of energy that I invest into art, into being a lawyer or a banker or whatever, right. the, the things that you said, um, and to be more comfortable just living a, a quote-unquote more typical life, just like a jobbed, employed life, right? right? Um, if I could take that pill and I knew that it was just, it, there was ignorance on the other side, like I wouldn't like miss what I had lost or something, right. I think I'd take it. Yeah. I think I would really take it. Um, or at least I worry that there's a lot of moments where I would take right. that pill. Uh, and it really becomes, it really kind of enshrines that feeling that you just described where it's right. like, you're really not free to define what your preferences right. are. You know, I can't help that. I just want to make art and I want to make whatever I want, right. you know, and I want to talk about weird things that are not really not commercial. They're not marketable. They're not really they're just not what you typically think of as the stuff that you would make money off of, or that's a job or, or anything like that. Right. right. And when, and when I'm working a job, if I'm perfectly honest, just a lot of the time I don't find it super creative yeah. and I don't enjoy the system. And right. I just wish I was doing something else, right. drawing something else, things like that. And I'm less interested in what that means about me or anything like that, right? Those right. are definitely personal troubles for me. But what's interesting to me is those feelings are not useful right. while I'm doing those things a lot of the time. Right. And you only have to encounter that for a little bit of time before you wish, right. you realize you can't control it, yeah. right? You really do. When I'm on a job and I wish I was drawing something else, God, I wish there was a pill that would, I know I'm gonna do the job either way, right? right? Yeah. God, I wish there was a pill that I could take that would make me just, that's the thing I wanna be doing right, right now. But you don't get yeah. to choose that right. in life. And at a certain point, your preferences are just, they arise from God knows where, you know? And they just, they drive you and they decide what you're gonna be into, what you're not gonna be into. Even if if that preference wasn't there, everything would be there, right. you know? You just can't help it. Well, and I found that that's actually the human condition. Mm -hmm. That's everyone, whether you're worth a billion dollars or you're homeless or whatever. You know, it's like you will regret the decisions that you've made, even if you knowingly knew in your life that that was the perfect decision for you at that moment, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, it's such a strange thing to observe in yourself that you're not necessarily always in control of, um, like, uh, at every point in your life, the decisions that you're making right now are going to be something you might regret somewhere down the line, yeah. right? Um, in the same way that it's going to be, you're going to look back at yourself and be like, that was the right decision, you know? And you're constantly switching between being uh, totally okay with yourself and being somebody who feels like a complete fraud yeah. and uh, a liar and, you know. Um, a liar is a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and I, I guess part of this entire trip is trying to come to terms with whatever that means, you know. Like, what does it mean to be an artist? What does it mean to commit yourself to something, you know? Like, I feel like my definition of success is... Um, cameras have to restart constantly because it only records for a certain amount of time. Oh, God. Um, Those goddamn restrictions. The worst. Um, but I think my definition of success is like, how good do you feel about yourself and do you spend the time, your time doing the things you really want to be doing, yeah. you know? Um, and uh, I guess it's been strange to me observing how many people compromise their lives and how they spend their time for external validation or, um, you know, they end up spending time doing things that actually, ex like, uh, fundamentally would never choose to do if they had the choice excuse me, have the choice not to. Absolutely. Um, well, it, it's tricky though. I mean, I know you understand, but it's, it's amazing how tricky it is because yeah. the demands on people are, are really crazy, you know? And, and if you have a family, close friends, uh, there's so many conditions and factors around what's available to you, yeah. what your options really are, you know, like, it's one thing to say, all right, well, this is what I would really love to be doing. This is, if I didn't need external validation and things like that, this is what I would do. Right. But what happens when the answer to that, right, something like art is like, okay, you can say that, but then how do you do that? 
right. how the hell do you actually live like that, yeah. right? And it's different from person to person, right? You might be, you might be a person, for example, who you 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 realize what you really want to do, right. right? You've gotten over, let's say, the social stigma of saying, "I want to be an artist," yeah. or you've gotten over the social stigma of thinking you're creative enough to right. be an artist, to even call yourself that, yeah. right? You've gotten over that. Now you're just in the practicals. You're just like, all right, well, I'm going to own it, right? You might be the kind of person who you say, all right, I want to be an artist. And just by your life circumstances, you happen to have a partner who makes a ton of money yeah. and they just want you to be happy. So that partner then says, do it. I'll support you forever. And right. you know, I have more money than I know what to do with and we're good here, right? That person is done. They really did it, right? If, oh. if their guess was right, they're just an artist now. They don't have to worry. Right. They just get to do it, right? right. And then you might be the kind of person who you don't have that partner. No. You have extra steps. No. You don't get to just do it, right. right? You have to now, now you have demands on you that that other person did. Right. You have to find a way to make it marketable. You have to find a way to make people care. You have to find a way to feed yourself while right. you do that thing. If your idea of being an artist is that it's what you do, right? It's your, right. your full on job. Your identity. Um, and it's, that's crazy, right? Especially because in, once you get into like the art markets and right. stuff like that, then those people are are meeting, right. right? Then you're, if you become a commercial artist or stuff like that, you encounter, you find the truth is that you wind up working with people where it's like, oh my God, you don't need to be doing this at all. And right. you're working for pennies yeah. because your money comes from elsewhere. Yeah. And you know, another person on the same team is like, I need to be doing this and I right. can't be working for pennies because I need to support a family right. with this. and everything gets all topsy-turvy and there's people in just wildly different situations. Right. Um, which is really not the case for other lines of work right. and other and other career choices that people make, right? It yeah, is for yeah. some, but it, it's interesting how strange and hairy it can get in the hard work. Yeah, like no one's a plumber for fun, right, generally, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not going to encounter a plumber who's just like, ah, I actually have money from other things, but... Well, I, I, I don't know. I, the thing I've been trying to do is not tying my identity to being an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think... Why is that? Well, the goal is for me is to equate like drawing and painting to like going for a walk, you know, mm -hmm. or just watching TV. It's just something that I do on top of everything else I do. It doesn't make me an artist in the same way that me like going for a walk doesn't make me a walker or a runner or playing music or listening. To, you know, it's like right. once you tie your identity to being an artist or something else, that means it's something that's like um, it has a, a failure and success name, you know. Like, if I don't make money off this, then I'm a failure as an artist. Whereas if you're just a person that does art, your chances of being successful at art, it becomes as long as you just draw, you know? Yeah, any day that you drew, you did it. Yeah, 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 you're, you're, you're successful, right? Um, and I think it's fish, it, it's, I, I disagree fundamentally. I mean, I for, for myself at least, I disagree with myself being um, somebody who makes money from images because I think it's, you're asking essentially for external validation from other people just by the nature of you wanting the approval to get their money, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that's... That's a surprise. Is that thunder? I think so, yeah. Wow. It's sunny out. Actually, that's not a surprise. I think I remember seeing on the weather. I think it, it, it's going to rain tomorrow, I, I saw. Uh-oh. Um, got a surprise for you. Right now, I'm calling the Yeah. Possibly thundering by 4 p.m. Hell yeah, dude. That, that hasn't right. happened in the podcast yet. Get, get your wildest thoughts out now before okay. we have to close the doors. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, we could shut the door and it'll still be raining outside, but um, it'll be slightly louder. Oh, yeah, yeah it works. It, 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 oh, okay. I, I've done it before. Um, but I was talking to, I've been talking to a lot of people about this where it's like, I've met the widest range of successful people going from, you know, being worth almost nothing to being worth close to a million dollars or more, you know, and then seeing how the problems of anxiety and self-esteem and feeling bad about yourself don't go away no matter how successful you are, no matter how many followers you have, no matter how much money you have, no matter what, there is some, like, that stuff just, just doesn't go away, you know. Yeah. And I always think about how Michelangelo, when he was working on his second PA Tom right. at like 70, at the height of his artistic powers, right. was so frustrated and doubtful and angry with himself that he actually took a chisel to it himself. He tried to destroy it on his own. Right. Um, that's a pretty brutal lesson for anyone, uh, for any artist, I think, that 
you could be Michael freaking Angelo, right? and you'll still, you're not going to feel cool about this. You well, know, and you, you still, still die, right? Yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's like, ultimately the goal, I, I think the problem with tying your, uh, who you are, your validation to being an artist is that you're signing up for that. You're signing up for that kind of crazy emotional roller coaster, you know, yeah. feeling like you're complete dog shit all the time, you know, which and I don't. That's even if you signed up for it. If it's not that you just found yourself there because right. you didn't even, you didn't know what you were signing up for. Right, you know, right. You know? um, and it, it, again, it, it's like, I think it's almost inevitable because you're asking to be paid money for it. So you, you're like asking for another person's set of success and failure for your own art, you know, um, which again, I think is dangerous because you're, uh, for me, art was becoming a place of anxiety, like a place of fear, a place of like, I would feel like I wasn't playing while I was doing it. I was thinking about like, okay, if I study these things, if I listen to these people, then maybe I can like start doing the kind of art that will finally get me the validation I'm looking for, right. you know, versus looking inside myself for what I actually truly want to be doing. Yeah. You know? um, I totally get that. Yeah. And I think the second that art becomes something that's like, uh, your, it's no longer a safe place. You can no longer really be an artist. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah. That's really hard. And, and, you know, I've been there. I feel fortunately right now, it could change again, but fortunately right now, um, it's sort of the opposite for me. I'm at a space now where when I'm, when I'm making art, it's good. Mm -hmm. That's that's the safe space right now. There's been times like you described in the past where it was not um, a safe space. Right now, the actual sitting at the table and drawing is in a good place. When I'm in there, it just feels amazing yeah. and everything else goes away and the anxieties and worries are really in the stuff around it and right. how to operate everything that's around it. Well, I, I feel like, I, I don't know, I, I don't know if I told you, but I, I, you know, I was on the path to being like a concept artist in games and I was yeah, in Cambridge for, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which I think we talked about it a little bit, but I feel like w I stepped away from that goal, and I feel like once I've done that, I've become a lot better of an artist. You know? Oh sure. I like it's kind of strange. I enjoy drawing way more. I'm becoming better. I'm. Oh yeah. You know. No, no, that, that I'm makes having, having a lot more fun too. That know? makes perfect sense to me because concept artist is just like that's a super niche, right? Tiny, tiny, new, made up thing. Right. There's no reason that channeling yourself into that is. Um, is going to go up well right. or that it's going to be this source of bountiful inspiration or anything right. like that it's it's a pretty niche product yeah. one that i expect will change very soon probably very soon but yeah. um it's just a very popular container right now right. i think for a lot of people's aspirations yeah as someone who went in for that early on my guess is that it's so popular because and i mean popular from the outside because on the the truth of the matter is that very few people who want to get into concept art have any idea what it actually is. Yeah. Right. They just have no clue and they haven't really investigated it. Right. Um, and I think that the reason that so many people are interested in it, even though they don't know what it really is, is because from the outside, it seems like a container for drawing. Yeah. It's one of the few jobs that when you look at it, people are like, oh, you get to draw if you do this job right. and you get to draw all sorts of stuff and right. it's like broad. Right. Yeah. And there's like, three jobs left that are that's like storyboard artists concept artists and comic book artists yeah and there's very little else in life that promises to let you draw right so i think that that's why it's very popular and um i think that the urge to all right i'm gonna get weird here yeah. i don't i don't know i don't know if i really believe this right i'm just i it's just my speculations right i think drawing and i really mean specifically drawing is a very primal human urge. Yeah. There's something deep in there that we have not worked out of ourselves yet. There's, it's just intimately linked with uh, with the creative urge somewhere in there deep down. And there's always going to be a certain proportion of the human population that want to draw, yeah. want to, whatever it is. And it has, it has to draw. It just has to do it. And there's very little opportunity now. Like I said, there's probably only like three containers. And so everybody's funneling into that. Right. So everybody, I think a lot of people right now think they want to be a concept artist just because they're desperate to find an excuse to draw. Right. And they don't actually want to be a concept artist. They just right. want to draw. They need some way to be able to draw. Right. And that's what's sort of 
everyone's just getting funneled into that concept of it. Right. Thing. When, when I hear, these days, when I hear students say something like, I want to be a concept artist, right? And if I don't have any other information from them, my first impulse is actually, I don't believe you. Yeah. Like, prove it. Really? You really think you want to do that? Do you have any idea what that means? What is contained in that? Do you have any idea what kind of temperament that actually aligns with? Most people don't. And I need to see more to be convinced that they would actually want to do that yeah. or be happy doing that. Right. You know, it's a very, very specific niche thing. All of that to say, it makes sense to me that once you try concept art, you're like, oh, this isn't it. And you actually mm-hmm. blossom more afterwards just because it's a very small bottle. It's absolutely. a very, very small bottle. There's much more to art. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and I think you're absolutely right. Like people want to get into concept art because they think they'll be able to draw all the time. Mm-hmm. And then once they get there, it's like, this is not what I signed up for. This is not what I thought it was. Yeah. You know, you get to draw sometimes. Right. Sometimes. Yeah. Well, and I think it's like a, I, I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard the fisherman's fallacy, right? I don't think so. Though. So, so the fisherman's fallacy is there's a guy sitting by a lake and he's fishing and a guy comes up to him and says, why don't you buy, why don't you hire somebody to help you fish? And then you could double your fishing output so you can maybe buy you know, a boat to, you know, be able to get even more fish. And then maybe you can work towards buying a fleet and hiring a crew. Right. And then once you have the crew, then you can make a, you know, make a fishing corporation that ship internationally. And then you'll have the ability to retire early. So you can mm-hmm. do whatever you want. And he's like, why would I do that? And it's like, oh, so you can do whatever you want. And uh, he's like, I'm doing exactly what I want right now. I'm fishing on the side of a river, you know. Mm-hmm. That's like, what I, he would do if he retired with the fishing fleet. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it's like, um, sir. Okay. Um, you know, it, I think it's the same thing for drawing. You know, I, I think it's like, uh, like, what do you want to do? I want to draw. You know, oh, why do you want to, like, oh, if you go and become a concept artist, then you can earn all this money so you don't have to worry about rent. And then you could, like, you Spend know, all your time drawing. Yeah, yeah. And, and ma- yeah, maybe you could start, you know, uh, make your own outsourcing studio. And then you can maybe, like, um, you know, pitch a Netflix movie so maybe it'll make a ton of money then you could retire early so you can so you can draw <laughs> you yeah. can finally draw you can finally do whatever you want and it's like if you just give up the need for external validation the need to live in a really nice place the need to get the approval of your parents and other people then you can just actually just start living your life yeah. you know I, um, I, I encounter a small version of this um, with some regularity with uh, job offers but when gigs come in sometimes you know either you, you're saying no to it and they're trying to keep you on the line right. or they want to give you more information about it um, and this isn't a bad thing I just think it's funny right I, like I don't think there's any alternative to this but sometimes the AD or the person who's trying to hire you will be like um, look I think you're going to be I think you're going to be really into this because um, the, um, uh, this is the job right we're going to draw this weird thing or I think this is right up your alley and wouldn't it be cool if you got to draw this and I'm always in the back of my head I'm like you know I can just draw whatever I want right. if I'm not working for you yeah, right like right. It, it, you're not there's nothing on the hook for me yeah. because you're dangling some specific assignment that you think aligns with me. It's like, if, if I, I can draw whatever I want if right. I'm not under any strictures I'll draw exactly what makes me happy yeah. it's not actually a it's not actually an add-on yeah. that your gig is like aligned or interesting or something right. like that. Like I could be doing what the only time you're ever doing something that is perfectly interesting to you is if it's something that arose from. There you're doing. Yeah, truly. absolutely. Yeah. Right. So it's like a small version of, of the fisherman's fallacy. Yeah. Right. And I, I think it's, um, you know, I, 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 we might've talked about it before, but the question I ask everybody is, would you be doing exactly what you're doing right now if you had a billion dollars, yeah. if you didn't have to worry about money? And if the answer is no, then you should change what you're doing, you know? Yeah. And it's like, if I found that like, you might be able to pay me to not paint. You might be able to pay me to never do art again, right? right. It's like, if you offered me a hundred million dollars and said, you get this hundred million dollars, but you can never draw a picture again, I, I actually might take it, you know? Right. Um, and I asked Ahmed the same question and he, and he said, no, he would not take it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's like if you answer that question for yourself, is like, is this thing so meaningful to me to where if I had all the money in the world to not do it, would I still, would I still do it? You know? Yeah. No, that's and, a rough one. Um, and, and I don't think I, I don't I don't think I would take. Well, if we're in a, if we're in like a perfect version of that scenario, where that's really all it's about, no, I wouldn't. Right. I could I couldn't take the. The money. I don't know. I, I really. 
you know, when I go on vacation, I'm interpreting everything through drawing and yeah. art making and being inspired, right? It would rob so much from my life. So which meaning, right? Maybe all the meaning. Yeah. Uh, besides yeah. the interpersonal meaning that is generalized, right. everybody gathers meaning from their, their family right. and the people that they love. But outside of that generalized meaning that everybody gets, I think it would take all the meaning. Absolutely. I, I would run out of personal meaning. So I, I know I wouldn't take the money, but uh, once we look at the not ideal scenario, if I had an especially nefarious person asking, <laughs> offering me the money, and they were they were like, all right, I'll give you a billion dollars to never draw again. And I was like, no, fuck no. Yeah. You curse on this podcast? Yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. Fuck, okay, shit. Cool. Fuck, good, good, good. fuck. And I was like, no, fuck no. And they were like, oh, but what if you did like an earning to give kind of a thing? You have to think about all the good you could do in the world with the billion dollars. I mean, aren't you a thoughtful person? Don't yeah. you think you could invest all your energy into saving people's lives with yeah. a billion dollars? Buy malaria nets in Africa or something yeah. like that. That'd be like, mm, God, Jeremy, well, yeah, maybe I, we have I, to I, buy the goddamn nets, you know? Well, yeah, at that point, you're ethically uh, obligated. You're yeah, right. That's why I said only in a, only in a very narrow version right. of the money question right. would I refuse the money. Right. At a certain point, it's like my joy from drawing would really have to be balanced against the lives of human beings, and that's a that's a problem. That's well, a real problem. Yeah, it's like Satan is offering you a hundred million dollars, but you could never draw again. Probably don't take the hundred million dollars. No, there's a trick in there. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So it's nuanced. It's nuanced. Um, but I think it's like a the thing that I've been thinking about is like meaning in general, where it's like. Like, and I know such a wide range of people with so many different levels of wealth and um, people that are living extremely meaningful lives are completely meaningless. Like, so, so subjectively, they feel like their lives are meaningless, you know? Yeah. Um, and, like, I was in Montana and I was staying with some friends who are uh, hiking guides. And, you know, they don't, they don't, they make like twenty or $30,000 a year or something. They don't make a ton of money, but they live, ex- they live in a tent city and they pay $100 a month for the campsite. And they just go on hikes all the time. They share a kitchen with 50 other people and, they, they live like a really meaningful life you know it's like the things that are being put in front of them are in a sense the things that like God put in front of them and the, the problems that they're having to solve like they have to like deal with a particularly like picky Karen of a, of a guest for a hike you know and I think that in a sense you get meaning from that you know oh, sure and the thing to shy, shy towards and to, to move towards is like the things that are actually make you kind of uncomfortable mm-hmm. things that kind of like create meaning in your life because uh, the default is nothing right the default is like um, like the fact that we can pay attention to anything is so bizarre right it's like yeah. even just walking down the street like uh, as people who are individual arts we see completely different things as somebody who's even like into music or an architect sure. or and it's like but everything is around us it's like there's graffiti art over there that I didn't pay attention to till just now right and it's like for the trains it's like you could spend your entire life building trains and um, even in this like small like 0.1 mile diameter there's an incredible amount of meaning if you're able to see it you know and i think the second you start compromising meaning for money meaning for other things meaning for things that you know give you external validation you're giving up part of who you are fundamentally you know it's like if you took the 100 million dollars you actually wouldn't be able to see value in going to the Met anymore, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, At least for me. Yeah, yeah. I think. Right. Yeah. Um, and, it, well, it, and it's like you, you're actually giving up the ability, you might be giving up the ability to appreciate art, you know, in general. It's like, possible. Yeah. yeah. I might be the kind of artist who really, my enjoyment of other art is self-reflexive. It, it involves in some great portion what I'm going to sublimate that into. Not everyone's like that, but I suspect I'm probably like that. If I could offer a caveat to what you just said, um, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that the feeling of not having meaning is the standard I, or the where most people start. I think that there's a significant portion of people who the standard is actually just non-questioning. Right. Just your meaning has been handed to you by society or culture, and you have not turned a skeptical eye to it at any point. You know, you just yeah, without any analysis, you just accept that you are trying to make a lot of money and that you will get a sick place to live if you do that or something like that. And it's not that you have no meaning or even that you really thought about meaning. It's just that you 
it was packaged for you. Right. And you took it and you, you don't even worry about it. You know, you just worry about the operational portion right. of doing that. And I think that for a lot of people, that's actually the standard. I think that you and I are part of a self-selecting set right. where we are uh, a kind, charitable interpretation might be analytical or right. reflective and a dark interpretation might be neurotic yeah. where we're just like questioning everything. It's a bit of both. I think. It's a bit of both. Yeah. I'm definitely... my love for art is definitely not all good like I have an ego like I want people to like the things I do mm -hmm. you know, which is true that's objectively true you know like I can have low self-esteem I want people to like my stuff more on Instagram you know yeah um, and I think when you acknowledge that it's like oh shit I'm not like a good person all the time and I'm not you know um, I get it, it it is self-serving to a, to a certain extent you know oh yeah um, I was very well I don't know I mean it is it is self-serving. And especially when you get in the neurotic mind frame and you start worrying about some of the stuff that you that we've been discussing, right? Like when I think about the when I think about the sheer volume of hours and thoughtfulness and ingenuity that I've dumped into art making, right? And like you said, I consider the possibility of having dumped that into being a banker or something like that. And for example, the since we're being candid here, when I imagine the security I could have offered my wife yeah. if I had dumped all of those hours of ingenuity into being a banker, yeah, yeah there's guilt. Yeah. Of course. Right. You know, there's if you're in that dark mindset right. and you're worrying about that, there's plenty of grounds for guilt. Right. And it's a hard thing to I don't know how to do it. Right. I, I don't think about it often, you know. Um, or at least I try not to, but it's there on bad news. I think it's a real concern. It's like anyone who's dealing with the real things in life. Um, it's still narrow-minded yeah. to worry about that, though, because then you start asking, you're only the person you are, right? right. Um, yes, if I had dumped all of that ingenuity into being a banker, um, I could have offered a different kind of security, but I'd also probably be a very different person to be around yeah. and less, uh, I might be less inclined to be happy or less inclined to be um, jocular or anything like that. And who knows, maybe uh, I probably, with my personality type, I'm not a very conscientious person, right? right? I have a hard time doing anything that I don't like doing, yeah. right? I can't, I can't push through things that I hate. Right. It hurts my heart. It hurts my person. It hurts my whole being right. to do that. I'm very low in conscientiousness in that way. So probably I couldn't have dumped all of that ingenuity right. into being something like a banker, right? Because right. it doesn't bring me experiential joy moment to moment. Drawing does in spades that other things don't offer. Right. So probably it's the only thing that I could have done it realistically. But yeah, when you put yourself in a horrible comparative mindset, tons of guilt. Oh yeah. Very feeling like it's self-serving. Very selfish. Right. Kind of, right. You could have helped others so much more with the kinds of resources you could have gained from the banker thing. Right. I'm not here to be mean to bankers. You guys just make a lot of money. You're yeah, an yeah. obvious choice. Money for, money is nice. Yeah, yeah. people with I'm resources. sure there are people that are bankers that love their lives that are completely validated by it. Are bankers even we're talking about? We're talking about like investment bankers, right? Yeah, just people rich people. Yeah, stocks. like people that do. Bankers just means rich people. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah, rich people. yeah, yeah, rich people. Yeah, yeah. Rich people. Cryptocurrency traders. Okay. But. Um, I don't know. I, I've been thinking a lot about Carl Jung, and I've been watching car lectures on Carl Jung. Um, there's this one by Jordan Peterson where he was comparing uh, the Lion King to Carl Jung and the archetypal story and how uh, the idea of Scar or like the, uh, you know, uh, like Satan is tied deeply to intelligence. You know, it's like, Scar is Satan for all intents and purposes in The Lion King. Um, yeah. And the, the thing with that is that Scar is a very rational, intelligent character, right? Yeah. It's like, I, I'm, not, I'm not the lead of this pride, and I'm not, the, I'm not the alpha lion. What can I do to become the alpha lion? And it's to kill Mufasa. It's to you know, kill my ideal, to kill everything that's holding our society together to become, to, to become king, essentially, yeah. you know? And I think that... Um, those thoughts of like, uh, if I were just a banker, you know, yeah. then I, then my life would be better. You know, it's, it's like, I think that 
that could be again i'm i could be talking on my ass i could be completely wrong well, we're talking about hypotheticals yeah, so yeah. of course we're talking about our ass <laughs> we you know at, i whoops we're back on the free will thing uh i happen to be uh basically a determinist as i understand it so i actually don't think i actually don't think anything else was an option yeah. i'm just mining these hypotheticals for knowledge oh yeah but right. i i can't experience this is just going to sound more selfish and uh, narcissistic, but I can't quite experience true regret yeah. because I don't actually believe anything else was an option. Yeah, I do believe that my preferences and what I was going to do and what I was not going to do, if I rewound the universe, I would have done the same thing like cl clockwork over right. and over and over yeah. again. Right. Um, so that does inure me a bit to any kind of ultimate regret. Right. But um, yeah, we are talking out of our ass because these are hypotheticals. Well, but but I, I but I also think that but there is a moment of like I wish I had more money. I wish I had more sure. of this thing, and it's like I think everyone has that, and I think it's. But you don't need regrets to have that. You can oh, yeah, look yeah. at someone else's money. And oh like, shit! Oh, that's nice. That. Oh, that's good. cool. Yeah, yeah. I have a Tesla. It's sick. Yeah. But but it's I think it's like that's the idea of how we're susceptible to Satan or evil or whatever is that we rationalize things. We're like, you know, imagine if you were in a really dark spot and it's like you guys were losing your apartment right mm -hmm. it's like you were in a place where you actually really needed the money oh, it's yeah. like you actually might start compromising like okay maybe becoming a banker is worth sacrificing drawing you know and it's <laughs> and be, it, imagine that was your situation you're getting kicked out of your apartment yeah. and you're an artist and you're like fine i guess i'll be a banker yeah, 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 yeah. like that wouldn't be it you'd like go work at starbucks yeah yeah right. like i guess i'll make a ton of money yeah, yeah. whatever you'd have to be, yeah, yeah. be a very specific person to have those two options right, available right. i guess i'll be a banker and stuff. well I, I, I guess i guess the more appropriate thing might be like i i couldn't make it as a fine artist so i guess i'll you know um, and I'm not saying teaching is bad, obviously, I believe in teaching, but maybe I'll just go all into teaching, even though it's something I don't want to do. Right. Yeah. Or all into concept art, or all into illustration, because it'll make more money, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's like, uh, and to look at yourself as like, oh, I'm selfish, I'm, I'm lazy, I'm the worst person for not, you know, for not sacrificing this part of myself for the greater, the greater good, right? That's a gateway to hell. Yeah, seriously. For sure. Yeah, yeah and it, I think it's like, uh, you know, there's that, it's like, Treating yourself like you're somebody responsible for helping is a very important thing to do. And you would never recommend to anyone else if they really love their job and love what they're doing, they have a passion for it, yeah. to just be a banker instead because, no. you know, you'd never recommend that. No, never. But then you us... You would as, always encourage them. And, and any time that they chose to go for that passion, yeah. you would be proud of it, right? You would right. think, oh, damn. Oh, inspiring, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. It's, it's you amazing. Would, you would never look at it from the dark side. Right. The fucker, but, but you look at yourself in that way. Of course. Yeah, and it's such a strange... Yeah. Such a, like, we, we give ourselves... We, we I, I think in, a, in some sense, it's like a laugh, lack of self-respect to have those thoughts or a lack yeah. of self-esteem or as, something. As the greatest philosopher of our time, Ariana Grande, oh, said yeah. in POV, uh, I wish I could see myself the way you see me. I don't even think those are the lyrics, but anyone who's heard that song... Oh, yeah, so I, I've, I've never never heard it, but it's not... Yes. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, no, I I agree completely. It is it is the the poison of our impulsive mind. You know, um, I mean, anyone who's seen my art knows I'm into Paradise Lost. I do pieces for it and stuff like that. And just because you're talking about Satan, our modern conception of Satan is very much just John Milton's yeah. uh, Satan from yeah. Paradise Lost. He basically defined what the devil is and what that archetype is. We don't really you know, the adversary in the Bible is not super characterized. He just makes a couple of deals. Yeah. But um, in um, Milton's Satan is, I, Paradise Lost is a hard read, yeah. but um, I would advise anybody to just read the first half of the first book of Paradise Lost to see, like you said, how rational Satan's internal monologue is and how it's the beauty of what Milton did there. It's a slap in the face. He was a truly religious person, so he was doing it to make people feel bad and to like turn the lens on them. But Satan's internal monologue is you're with him. You yeah. get it completely. And you sympathize with him utterly. 
yeah. right? He he just lays out the case perfectly, yeah. like better to serve, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Yeah. And I didn't know God was all powerful. He didn't let us know. I was yeah. just rising to normal stature. Is there anything wrong with ambition? Is that not a virtue? Like right. he lays out a perfectly rational tack that makes you sympathize with um, someone who's basically just undercutting themselves yeah. at every turn, which is really, that's why we love, uh, that's why Satan feels modern and we love him when you read that stuff because right. it is the modern condition. It really yeah. does feel a lot like the modern condition. Absolutely. It's haunted. It's haunted. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and again, seeing your, seeing your own version of that, seeing how... Uh, It is a little loud. <laughs> um, you know, seeing in the ways that you uh, you actually can be like Satan is like a. I, I read a Mere Christianity on this on this car ride. Have you have you read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis? Um, I, I I'm a little familiar with C.S. Lewis's series of Christian thinking, but I haven't read any of his actual writing about Christianity. So so he has a book called Mere Christianity that. Uh, it was originally a series of talks he did on the radio that was like essentially in the same way that we're talking right now. Just a very casual, slightly academic, but not pretentious way of explaining Christianity, you know. And um, in it, he talks about how, again, like Satan is a very rational way of, you know, it makes sense. It's like, yeah, it's like, um, absolutely, it makes, makes tons of sense. And um, sorry if you're hot, by the way. Uh, you're hot too, so right. you don't have to be hot. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know right. we're both feeling this. Yeah, yeah, we're we're, we're in hell right now. It's but, really hot. Yeah, yeah, we're going it's about to hell. as close. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's cooler in hell. Than oh yeah, here. yeah. <laughs> Good, it's cool, cool. And right. less humid. There's no water down there. So. There's a leaf right here. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, I never thought about it. There's definitely less humid in hell because yeah. there's no water down there. That sounds nice. Oh, I'd rather be in hell. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. hell okay, yeah. Okay, keep going. Sorry. Well, I, I I remember I was talking. I'm not a Christian. I, I don't consider myself in particular religion but I was talking to a guy who's a devout Christian he was talking about how you know people who go to hell want to be in hell you know it's like they wouldn't even want to be in heaven that's how lost they are and I was like okay yeah that actually makes sense you know um and in mere Christianity he was talking about how like the idea of heaven and hell isn't like fire and brimstone you you go there you it's like one place or the other it's more of like you become this idea or this existential thing we can't even begin to comprehend that's influenced by who you were as a, as a, as a flesh and blood human being and hell and heaven is determined by like, if you lie occasionally every day over the course, if, if Christians believe you're going to live forever, uh, over the course of a million years of you existing, um, that small line every day is going to compound into hell. You know, mm. it's going to turn into hell. You know, whereas if you're living a very Christian or good life by what they define, um, you're going to be more, you're going to be closer to heaven than if, um, you know, over that course of, over that course of a million years. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it's strange. And it's like a, that. Well, form, any, any kind of, this conversation is always strange, trying to guess what happens. Right. Uh, after death and what God's plan for your eternal soul is. I think it's inevitable that it's going to get strange. I feel like I, I know what it is. Nice. Tell me. <laughs> All right. Uh, we got Christian right here. He I, I, I have the answer. He has the I ontological the truth of the universe. Let's hear it. I know what it is, and <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's what I know. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah, that's well, the best that's I could do. You know, the subjective, for in, a, in, in the sense of, um, of solipsism, uh, the subjective answer that you can acquire for yourself is the existential truth of the universe. So, good well, enough. Well, I feel like... It, um, the answer, my answer to that is that I actually don't think it matters what happens after we die, you know, because that shouldn't influence how we act as people when we are alive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's effectively the same whether it's true or not. You know? Well, truly religious people would probably hate that. Fuck that shit, dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah, how deep are we into this podcast? Yeah, yeah. Let's get real. I mean, anyone, anyone who's this deep in is probably along for the ride. Yeah, but, yeah, right. Yeah. No, I... Oh, man. Those questions are super interesting, and it's it's... I mean, of course they are. They're the questions that have interested everyone forever, yeah. right? And so much of our culture is based on them. Right. And it's it's insane. It's insane the variety of viewpoints that are out there on that. It's yeah. insane how some people let it influence their decision making and others don't, yeah. right? That's really weird that some people will base their whole lives on that and then other people will pretend, to, you know, that it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. That, um, and yeah, no one... It's fucked up. You can't even... What you said, like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, 
to me, I personally align with that, right? Like, yeah. I feel I feel utterly agnostic yeah. about uh, all of these things. Like, I don't, um, and even to say you're agnostic requires definition of terms, right? But yeah. I honestly can't imagine what evidence someone would need to show me one way or the other for any claim about what happens after death right. for me to be sure I would buy it. Right. I really don't know what it looks like. I could always say I'm being tricked. Right. So um, I, I really don't know what solid evidence would look like. Um, so I do find myself really uh, deeply agnostic on those things. But it's fascinating to see that. So what you said, like, I don't know, right? That feels like the rational tack right. for me sitting on the other side of the table. Like, that feels right. But it's crazy that in this world, you can't even get away with that, right? Because there's a huge portion of the world that's like, no, we fucking know. Yeah. And you got to live by it, right? That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy that things can be so... People can really be inhabiting such different, and that conditions your whole experience of life. People Absolutely. can be inhabiting such different worldviews. It's pretty amazing, I think. It's pretty incredible. It's the spice of life. Dude. Yeah, hell it's yeah, the best dude. Stuff that Fuck is yeah, so dude. varied, that it's so different. It would be horribly boring uh, if it was all the same. Well, I feel like I'm at a stage in my life where even if Muhammad or Jesus or Buddha or whoever showed themselves to me physically, I would not change my life at all. Like it wouldn't necessarily. Like I wouldn't, you know. Uh, I wouldn't stop doing certain things that are considered sinful. I just wouldn't. I just wouldn't, you know? Yeah. And it's like, even if I had the evidence itself right in front of me, I wouldn't, it wouldn't, like if Jesus were to walk up to here and we knew it was Jesus and he's like, my brothers, you must stop watching porn or so, you know, it's like, I don't. His number one concern. Yeah, 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 right. It's like, don't be gay. You know, yeah. it's like. He's it's, really, oh, he's caught yeah, up yeah. with it, man. That's right, a right. lot. <laughs> um, and it's like, I don't, I don't know if like that would, like even a word from God would, you know, cause me to live my life. I, I'm not saying I'm gay or, or anything, but, but I, I think it would, uh, uh, it would, I, I, I was telling you earlier, this trip, me driving around the country has affirmed my belief in a God, which mm -hmm. again, I don't know entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure what I mean when I say that, but I mean, feel free to explore. Like, what do you, what is that? Well, what does it taste like? It, it's like to go around the country and just to see, um, like, we're in one of the most beautiful populated places in the city where you can find an entire, you can find a million lifetimes of meaning in just this, mm -hmm. you know, 10 mile diameter, you know? Yeah. And the fact that we choose to sit on our phones and watch YouTube videos or play video games and not go and walk around Central Park or not go skydiving or not go and, you know, go to the Met or do it, like, you know, it, it's not the lack of meaning that's around us, it's our ability to see it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I think the idea of God, you know, um, like for life to be meaningless means that uh, we wouldn't have senses, we wouldn't have eyes or the ability to feel or smell or taste, you know, mm -hmm. which means that like just by the nature of us having things that allow us to sense things and interpret meaning out of protons and electrons and pieces of wood and oil paint on canvas. Yeah. Uh, I think that's my definition of God is like, it's, um, the fact that we are like 70% water and then iron and a bunch of other stuff that I could never even begin to explain. Right. Um, it's like in some sense a def, like, uh, a version of proof in God yeah. because we're able to like be this objective, objectively just pile of goop, yeah. but we see meaning and like, we see meaning. It's strange. We find meaning in things that are just completely... Uh, from an nihilistic point of view, completely pointless mm -hmm. and meaningless. Yeah. Uh, a few thoughts. Uh, I, I feel like I personally am right about there with you yeah. on that. Um, it's a little interesting for me because I was raised in a very uh, fundamental Catholic environment. Then, you know, like uh, like my mom is very uh, very fundamentally Catholic, right? And um, I, I feel I know, I'm just thinking about the train too. Yeah. Here's your character. We could just sit here and talk. Okay. We could uh, meditate for five seconds. You know, it might be um, it might be it might be better for everyone to have um it might be better for everyone to have armchair philosophizing about the nature of God be drowned out by train, you know? The, the audio is, is, is just a bar of PJ. It's completely <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's uh, awesome. I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I guess I'll... I, 
have to. I guess I have to do something about it. I think you'll have to do some editing on that one. Yeah. Any second now. It was the same thing for James's podcast. We, were, we did it on the street leading to Prospect Park. Oh, God. It was sirens. People were screaming. You know, tons of traffic. It was, it was actually worse than this, I think. I imagine. Yeah, Prospect Park is a very yeah. loud. But it was, it was pretty awesome. All right, anyway, what everyone missed there was the, um, the real answer to the nature of God. So if you're confused about that, just rewind. Yeah, yeah. You'll yeah. find it. The, the, the meaning to life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, That's you're, it. if you're asking yourself, why am I here? You're no. just, you need to go back uh, 45 seconds. At the end. Well, I, I feel like I feel like the actual meaning to life, I, I feel like I know what the proper path is now. You know, I feel like uh, if you feel like you don't have any meaning in your life, uh, just start trying to look for it. Like go, instead of like um, spending time on your phone, like go for a walk every day, you know? Like just do simple things. Go to a coffee shop and just sit around and look at people, look at things. And it just observe, like just the amount of things going on at all times, no matter if you're in the middle of Iowa or, you know, in the middle of like Greenland where there's no one around for like a thousand miles, you know, it's like, um, the problem isn't the lack of meaning in the world. It's our ability to see it. It's like you could spend your entire life studying a leaf, you know, like the, how it made, how it's made up in terms of its physics. Um, the actual, like evolution it took to actually get there, the culture of why that tree is there, why it was planted, um, I guess like the effect of that tree on the ecosystem, you know, like so many different things that you can spend a lifetime studying. It's just our ability to see that as something worth doing. So I'm never gonna study a tree. I don't care, I don't give a shit about it. Unless you draw it. Yeah, yeah, I, a, I guess that, so, yeah. That's yeah. the secret to studying it for a long time. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'm gonna use Buddhist language here because that's what I'm really familiar with. Right. Um, but yeah, everything that you describe to me through a Buddhist lens is just you increase your mindfulness. You know, yeah. you just slow down a bit. You become very mindful, aware of what you're experiencing, what you're seeing, seeing what you're feeling. Yeah. And for almost everybody, if you do that, the more you do it, the more pregnant with meaning it becomes. You know, you absolutely just, uh, you reduce the amount that you're distracted by discursive thinking and. Uh, things carrying you away right. and things just things purify things calm down in sort of a natural state of yeah I guess I don't know how to describe it but there's like secret profundity lurking everywhere even in just your breath even in just feeling well it, it, there's an incredible amount of meaning in, in literally everything like I remember I was talking to Marshall Vandruff about this where he was taking a uh, um, meditation or mindful eating class where you would eat a starburst for like 30 minutes you know and it's like you could be like a starburst is one of the sweetest things on the planet you know in terms of like it's just made to be extremely it's packed with sugar baby. packed with sugar extremely addicting you know um and we will fucking scarf those things down like no one's business you know oh, yeah. um and it doesn't get much like tastier than that right it's not get, much I mean, it's the same There's ice cream. Well, they, what about Snickers? They're better. Oh, well, okay. I'll, I'll eat Snickers as like like the best yeah. possible can. You're like you'll eat a Snickers in like a minute. Good, you know? good. Okay. I just wanted to right. make sure that we okay, we're well, clear on uh, the hierarchy of okay, candy. Well, here. Snickers is is below Twix. What the fuck? Snickers is below. Hey, honestly, it's like a, a B level candy for me. Different podcast. <laughs> Let's just move on. Okay. Different podcast. Okay. Fine. Okay. Get get the fuck out of here, dude. Get out of your own bed. <laughs> Go get a Snickers and a Twix and have a taste <laughs> test right here. Um, but no, but, but it's like, I, I found that like, in, in a certain sense, I, I would be in the, uh, in so many different parts of my life, I'll be around the best teachers or I'll be in the middle of like Yosemite or like in the middle of where I'll be around the best art, mm -hmm. on the, like at the Met or Boston Museum of Art or at the National Portrait Society in London. And I will like, instead of looking at this art, I'll like browse Reddit on my phone for sure. Five, you know. Um, and it's like, uh, you know, the problem again, isn't the lack of quality or meaning in there. It's, it's my ability to go and see it to perceive. Uh, and it's like almost, it, it takes practice, you know, it takes practice to see that. And having more money doesn't mean you have more meaning in your life at all. You know, it takes like, pra and it actually might take away from it because you're focused so much on, um, like just increasing a number that's kind of like arbitrary nonsense, 
you know? Yeah, well, we have... So I personally believe in single-pointed attention. Uh, I do not... I don't think we can multitask in actuality. I think, you know, from... Just from some of the science, because the science does seem to bear this out, uh, just from the popular science that I've read uh, from neuroscience, and just from if you pay attention to the way that you experience things in the world through meditation or just mindfulness while you're living, right. it seems we can't actually multitask. Yeah. If you're multitasking, you're just rapidly switching a moment of attention from one thing to another. Yeah. But it seems all you can really do is pay attention to one thing at yeah. a time, right. which means that attention is finite. Yeah. It means that there's only so much attention, moments of attention you can fit in a day. Yeah. So everything that is, the way you interact with things that are impinged upon you from life, right? People yelling at you, just random stuff that you don't control. And the way that you interact with the conditions that you give yourself, right? Let's say you're obsessed with your bank account, right? Yeah. That's a condition you gave yourself. Yeah. You've gotten that job, you want to make more money. You have set up that conditioning factor for yourself, right? All of those things together, you're setting up systems and you're being influenced by outside things such that you are giving them a certain ability to carry away your attention, yeah. right? You can go a whole day letting your fears about your career dominate your attention yeah. from waking up to sleep. And you may have no moment, not one moment throughout the whole day where you clip it just briefly and give your attention consciously to something instead, right? Feeling like you're consciously choosing to give your attention to something else instead of being borne away right. by something that simply arose, yeah. right? The, the fact that we can be borne away by things that we don't feel like we control or systems that we don't feel like we agree to, the fact that we can be borne away by those things for not just a minute or an hour, but even years, is really, I find it scary. You know, I find it borderline horrifying. And as scary as that is to me, yeah, the solution to it moment to moment is to just snap in right. with attention and be like, I'm right here. What's yeah, I mean, going on right here? This is the best I can do. I mean, being okay with who you are right in the moment. Yeah, you know? and just accepting it and, yeah. and feeling it. Um, there's, um, there's a feeling that I often get when I sit to meditate that probably anyone who has tried a practice of sitting meditation uh, for any period of time is probably familiar with where sometimes I'll go sit in the seat to meditate and I'll start and I will immediately realize, oh shit, this is the first time in 24, 48, 72 hours that I am pausing. I have, for unbroken, for 72 hours, I have only been impulsively reacting moment to moment right. to what is coming and going. I'm not, I'm not, not I'm not seizing a moment at all, right? I'm just being born away by my random thoughts and by the things happening to me in life. Right. And then you sit down for a second and you're like, oh God, this is the, this is the first time I've woken up right. in 24 hours, yeah. 48 hours a year, right? right. And, uh, and that's- 10 years, humbling. 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well that, right. the first, if anyone has had any very scary moments in meditation, right? Where you, there are moments available in, in the meditation practice or just in life where you do literally sit down and you're like, oh my God, this is the first time I've been fully aware since I was born. Yeah. This is fucked up. Yeah. And then that can feel like a, like a shattering experience. It can really change your life completely right, to have that experience. Um, but whether it's this is the first time I've woken up in a day or this is the first time I've woken up in my life, right. um, it's hard to, it's hard, it's a haunting feeling. It is a haunting feeling and it really makes you want to pay more attention. Like you said, like you said, just be with things more, right. feel them more. And for me, draw things more, you know, drawing things is a great way to study things and to be with things and to really investigate the nature of the mind and visual phenomena and the way right. things are experienced. Um, I think drawing really dovetails in a lovely way with right. all of that. Well, and I, I think it's like I equate being present as like walking with God, you know, like being one with God in whatever way that means, you know, it's like a... Um, well, in that moment, you're not lost, right? So. Well, and I, I think that, uh, I mean, people t 
talk about enlightenment, like it's a state you get there and then you stay up. You know? But I believe enlightenment is something where you get there and you're there for like a minute or five seconds or a second or half a second. And you have a moment of like, this is like, you have a moment of like, holy shit, like, I'm in Brooklyn. You know, I'm, I, I drove here, you know, I, or I like, I'm a person in a body that's like flesh and blood and my arms are gonna, could break or I could die, you know. Yeah. Um, you just become aware of like your vulnerability and who you are, you know. But it's not a state of permanence, you know. It's going to go away, and it's going to yeah. come back, you know. Um, You're think, always going to be born away by something, right? Well, I, I think that might be the defi definition of the Christian idea of like original sin, mm -hmm. you know, is that you are going to lose sight of just by the nature of being a person. You're going to lose attention. You can only focus on one thing at a one thing at a time, you know. Yeah. So, in a sense, you are flawed, you know. You aren't God. It's like you can't be an artist and also buy. Uh, mosquito nets for people in Africa. You, know, you, you just can't do it, you know. Um, and um, and it's like coming to terms with your vulnerability and your uh, lack of, uh, you know, how like your lack of power fundamentally, your yeah. lack of your ability to contribute to the world. You know. Um, it, I think that's a very important part of becoming a fully realized person, like letting go of your ego, letting go of like drawing and painting is not about being the best artist. You know, it's about communicating the Hopefully ideas that you want to. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, for, I think for a lot of people, it starts that way. You know? Yeah. Um, I would agree with that. Yeah. There's just some, it's weird. There's some, if you talk to people about how they got into art and where they started, it's almost universal that somewhere early on, envy or having something to prove was a big part of their art journey. Yeah, you know, for it's, sure. It's weird. It's, yeah. uh, it's almost universal yeah. in my experience. Very, I've encountered very few artists who just had a mature, balanced viewpoint from the start. Yeah. They're just like, no, I never thought about that. Yeah. It's just making stuff. Right. You know, I, I never really compared myself to others or things right. like that. Almost everybody has gone through some serious conflict with jealousy and wanting to be like others and wanting to compare themselves to them and surpass them. Yeah. Everyone seems to have had some big with that. Or a disproportionate amount of artists, I would say. There, maybe it's necessary. Well, yeah, again, that goes back to the idea of Satan because it's rational, right? It makes sense. It's like, oh, I should be better than that person, you know? Or I want to be better than that, than that person, you know? And it's that entitlement or that, like, um, that ego, that rationalization that convinces you you're right. You know, it's like, oh, I, I paid $200,000 to go to Art Center. I should be better than this person. You know, why did they get that job when I didn't, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's like, I totally understand that. It, it's like the human condition. Um, and I think a big part of, again, becoming successful is defining your own parameters for what success is. Yeah, like, internalize your goals. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, like, uh, so much of the stuff is like you start out wanting to be like your heroes you want to be like the painter you really love you want to be John Singer Sargent or you want to be Kim Jong-gi or you want to be whoever you know Cynthia Shepard or whoever and um, you go through there and you, you either become successful and you realize it's not for you or you don't become successful at it and then you have to like um, understand why that happened and the ways that you can grapple with like okay I wasn't successful at that why did I care about that in the first place? Why did that hurt my feelings? Why does it make me depressed that I'm not, you know, working on Magic the Gathering or something, you know? Um, and ultimately it's like, uh, you're tying the meaning of who you are towards, because fundamentally when you have a job or whatever else, you're, you're being validated externally by other people. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's like you're tied to the external validation of other people. And uh, maybe you like really want your parents to not think that your art is a complete waste of time, you know? Um, There's a lot of really, really hard emotional factors around any of that stuff, around where you're gonna get your validation from with art and stuff like that. Because it's really, it's really scary, I think, for a lot of people early on in this society to to say, like, I'm a creative person, or I think I deserve to be a creative person, or 
um, to say I want to I want to just make art or I, I just want to output and I just want to move towards this utterly personal thing that I right. think has value right? right that's a scary thing to say to your parents that's a scary thing to say to your spouse that's a scary thing to say to your dog right. honestly it's a really frightening thing to say in a lot of parts of society right, right? and it's much easier to couch it with this is a real job right you know this is a career that uh, I can get and people get it all the time yeah. um, and very quickly if you dance with that at all right you it becomes more and more real the yeah. more time that you spend with it right and if it was a life preserver at first very quickly uh, it's all it's all you know and you start to believe yourself when you say those things and then you sort of get lost and if you are the kind of person who did want something different at the beginning right if you're the kind of person who some people just want to be commercial artists the whole time yeah right and they want there really wasn't a moment where they shifted or anything like that it was from the start they were like i want to get paid to make art for movies right that's where they and those people don't really need a lot of help yeah. right? in my experience though i've met those people i have every reason to believe that that's true and they really don't seem to need a lot of help right, right? they really they're focused, they're yeah. on it, right? But for a lot of people who their ambitions or their desires were really born from a different place, from yeah. a more personal place, and then they started using the commercial aspect as a sort of a way to give this some societal rails so that it was acceptable, right. almost always the consequences of that arrive right on time, yeah. right on schedule. Right. You, you have to deal with that at some point. You yeah. will not be able to leave it behind. Right. Almost everybody has some moment where it's time to reckon right. with that and figure out what it really meant to you. Right. Um, and it's by turns, painful, enlightening, joyous, and horrifying, yeah. right? depending on the situation that you're in and your personal temperament. Right. But um, it really seems for most people there's no getting around it. Yeah. You do have to reckon with it at some point. Right. You either make meaning out of it out of you or you don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess it always comes back to your own perceptions of what success and failure are, you mm -hmm. know? Because it's like, um, you know, you could fit somebody else's, comp their exact version of what a successful person is, and you could not feel that way at all, yep. you know? And it's okay not feeling that. It's okay not feeling like you're a successful person, you know? Yep. And it's okay to try and make a change. And I think a big part of all this stuff is, like, um, really thinking about who you are and what you value. And um, I guess going back to the idea of the God thing is, like, I meet people that don't give a shit about Dean Cornwell or Line Decker at all. They don't even know who they are, you know. But to us, like Line Decker, Rockwell, Cornwell, um, did I say Cornwell already? Yeah. Okay. Well, if we know the list. Yeah, yeah. I the, think the, we know what kind of universe the, we're the, in the, here. The, the, the list of all the famous, you know, artists that everyone's like, oh, did you do you have that book? Do you have the Scar Robertson book? Or you know, yeah. it's like there are people that don't even know who they are, you know. Oh yeah, most people. Very niche, very product. very niche. Very niche you know? product. Um, and then living like that's the most important thing in the world. It's like it becomes the most important thing in the world, but not really. It's like it's completely meaningful to you, but uh, you have the ability if you really don't care about that stuff to not care about it. You know, to, to like not focus on it. You know. Um, and I if think if you if you if you're the kind of person who is gonna internalize their goals, yeah. right? It's very important that you realize there are no limits on it. You are really, it is completely structureless, right? Once you have broken through the illusion that your goals need to be external, that they need to meet something or anything, once you break through that and you're looking down the barrel of internalizing your goals, they're completely wide open. You get to pick whatever you want. Right. And I mean that really radically, right? Like truly, you get to pick whatever you want, right? Like you could say that you're you have succeeded if doing a painting manifests a bowl of udon soup on right. your night desk. Yeah. What? You get to say that, right? right? It's never going to happen, yeah. but you get to pick that as your goals, right? Yeah. But you can pick anything less crazy than that. Yeah. That does, for me, for example, um, I feel like these days I have internalized my goals yeah. in many ways for, for specifically for how I draw, yeah. right? For me personally, I don't care anymore how the drawing came out. Right. I really don't. If I was peaceful while I drew it, yeah. 
I've succeeded as much as I could want. Right. If I have not been borne away by the internal chaos that artists are susceptible to, right. if I experienced happiness while I drew, I really could not care less right. if it looks great or if it looks bad or if it looks mediocre. Those goals feel internalized to me, right? So I got to pick that. I got to say, my goal as an artist is when I sit, I feel peaceful. That's my number one goal. There's, it, you've got to condition that somehow, right? You, you're going to need to do whatever work is necessary for you to believe that, yeah. right? But once you're there, it's as valid as anything else, right. right? It is truly as valid as anything else. You can pick whatever you want. Yeah. Your goal as an artist to be, once you've internalized, it could be, if this picture makes my son laugh, yeah. I'm as good as Sergeant, right? right? Yeah, you get to fucking say that. Yeah. You really do. Yeah. No one gets to take that away from you. Yeah. You get to pick it as radically as you want. So... I just want to give that disclaimer for anyone who hasn't heard that or hasn't realized it. Internalize your goals if you're that kind of person, yeah. right? Like I said, some people, they never need to question it and they're perfectly happy yeah. with externalized goals. But if you're the kind of person who internalizing your goals is the way, you yeah. get to pick whatever you want. Right. You really get to pick whatever you want. Yeah. You shouldn't let anyone tell you otherwise. Absolutely. When I've been, I've been observing a version of that in myself where I have like 200 subscribers on YouTube right now and my podcasts have been getting like 100 views or something and I have the opportunity to do potentially like bigger things bigger things but I'm finding that I'm getting way more validation out of living in a van and driving around the country than I ever would by doing like big things things are you know, getting tons of views or making tons of money it's like I'm enjoying this way more I'm getting a lot more personal satisfaction and validation it's like the classic words of an artist of yeah, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> it's like how many artists have said that line yeah yeah, yeah. that's that's the artist at heart right yeah, yeah. There. absolutely because yeah. i know you're not bullshitting you yeah. really mean it right some people are really are the cynical side of artists where they say that and they're like they they don't really believe it did they say hi to you did they, did they, did they, damn well we, we, we can check the recording you know new yorkers are very prone to pretending filming isn't happening so yeah. they're we see weird stuff like this when we're yeah seen movies in a van yeah. But um, but the there, there is the cynical side of things where you say you don't really believe it, but you really believe it. you got the real artist heart. Well, no, I, I I can know I know that I believe it because I am um, it. You're bearing it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm choosing to do it, and it's like a um, I have the opportunity to not do it, you know, and I have the opportunity to do plenty of other things, and I'm choosing to do this instead, um, and it's uh it's quite cool. I think that's very cool. Um, I'm, I'm checking to make sure the audio is okay. Should I shout? Uh, talk to your normal speaking voice. I'm talking to my normal voice. It seems that when we're talking, everything's fine. I mean, that looks like a healthy waveform. It does. To me. It, it, it does very much so. Yeah. It's just whenever anything happens anything. out there, it, goes, <laughs> it freaks out. And I haven't been um, I haven't been very mindful of what it looks like when. Not the train. The train yeah. fucked up everything. Yeah. But I haven't been very mindful of what it sounds like when like a regular car goes by right. and we're talking. I would wonder if it's you know, it does go it's up. It's passable. It's passable. It's not clipping like crazy. Yeah. Well, I, I, a friend was showing me the different. I don't know what the name for these are, but there's like direct microphone mode, and then there's double mode, and then there's like around surround sound mode. Yeah. And I have no idea what. I, I think this is the double mode. This one right here. Okay. That would be right. It sounds about right. I think so. Um, like it does that and this, so but it doesn't get anything out here. Or would that be this one? I, I thought, I don't know. These are really the same thing turned at 90 degrees, quite, so that worries me. <laughs> it's quite confusing. It is, isn't it? Um, I, I think we'll be fine for this. But if you've recorded like this before. Yeah. Well, no, I, I, I switched it around for this, this podcast, so gotcha. we might be fucked. We might be. Yeah. You could pause it and listen back. I don't care. No. Fuck that. Yeah, fuck it. Yeah. Chaos. Yeah, chaos is a lot. See what happens. Fuck it. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's like a... Uh, meaning is subjective. People should do whatever they want. Um, unless that thing is murdering another person. Yeah, you might. Well, you know what? Some people still think it's fine to murder other people, depending on your meaning system. Yeah. So, it's a rough world out there. It's a complicated world. It's very scary. It is a very scary world. There's a lot to balance. There's a lot of fucked up shit. A shit ton of fucked up shit. You've noticed that too? Yeah. Me too. There's a ton of fucked up Weird. shit right there. It's like the Holocaust happened. Strange. Afghanistan. Kind of dark. Yeah. A little bit dark. Oh yeah, I, I guess I went to the worst possible thing. Yeah. Uh, but that's the reality yeah. of the world. So I, you gotta make a little bit of art. Yeah. 
you gotta make some art for play some video people and for yourself play some Mario Party sometimes yeah you gotta you gotta get the joy in there yeah. where you can you yeah. really can I mean joy is joy is it baby is it it is joy really it? you know let's get philosophical here is joy really it is it really about maximizing joy because the answer is no yeah do you uh, it, if we it, the maximization of joy would be the truly utilitarian consequentialist viewpoint is it the nihilistic point of view i don't know i really i mean nihilism i think nihilism classically interpreted would be that there's no possibility for substantive joy that is always going to be destroyed by right. darkness yeah i think that the idea that you should go for joy that might be hedonism yeah. right just like prioritizing your own selfish joy i think that's traditionally hedonism right but i think um if you open it up to beyond hedonism like there's personal joy and there's also the joy you get from charity and helping others and protecting yeah. others right if we fold that kind of joy in then we might just look at that as big joy right compassionate joy and then the question is well, compassionate joy sounds pretty goddamn good, yeah. doesn't it? It's including yourself and it's including others. Um, is that really it? Would it then be maximizing compassionate joy? It's the greatest thing you can do at every opportunity. And then would that be the definition of utilitarian consequentialist success, right? Any move that increases compassionate joy in well, the world would be maxing it out. My, no, it my, sounds good. But... My, my belief is that every way of looking at things is actually the right way of looking at things and it's all actually necessary to society working you know it's yeah. like without the variety spice of life kind of viewpoint absolutely i mean yeah. it, it's like i've been becoming a lot more spiritual over the past year or two years or something and i've been in the past i've looked at different religions as like how can you believe that one is more right than the other yeah you know and it's I'm no longer looking at it that way. I'm like they're all equally right. They're all look. They're all seeking truth. They're all mm -hmm. fundamentally trying to do the same thing. It's just how does that fit into your life in terms of convenience? That's how people choose. Yeah. You know, it's people like, pick the one that's most helpful usually, the one that makes them feel right. Well, and it's and it's generally you choose the one that it's like that your brothers and sisters go to, the one that mm -hmm. like. Yeah, yeah, and it's like the ones that your family goes to, or the one, people that you're most alike, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I, I went to a Mormon church and I went to a mosque, and I was talking to the guys who run it, and they, they told me a very reassuring thing. It's like, uh, a Mormon person believes that Joseph Smith came to the New World and found the, you know, testament from, you know, like to most people, it sounds like complete nonsense that yeah. America is the Holy Land, but this is what he believes. And he said, you know, essentially what he said was like, there's nothing that I can say they'll make you believe what I believe. Yep. It sounds ridiculous, but this is what I've observed to be true by going around and living my life, you know? And it's the same thing for the guy in the mosque. It's like, this is what I've observed. Um, there's nothing that I can say that will make you believe that what I, it's something that you have to go and find for yourself, you know? Um, and ultimately it's like a, uh, there is no wrong or right way to look at the world, you know? It's like... Um, well, not, not objectively. Like, I, I think... For for you, I mean, it's a, for each individual person. Oh, for for sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, in mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis talked about how morality or meaning is a spectrum like a piano, where every key is right and wrong at different points in a song. Yeah. But it's not, you know, like it's not two like pianos don't have two keys; they have like twenty eight keys or something. Twenty seven. I have no idea. I'm not enough of a musician to know that offhand. Yeah. Um, which is another like where in some ways professional artists right I guess you're more professional artist than I am but you know a lot about art and not know how many keys are on a piano you know <laughs> yeah. So. yeah not at all but but again I think it's like a um, you know I think when you're thinking about God and religion in the sense where it's like there's right and wrong there's more correct and less correct I think you're thinking about it the wrong way it's like um, it's all about like which like there are people that are born that are crazy, insanely dedicated towards being just completely in your face about religion. And that's mm -hmm. never going to go away. Yeah. In the same way. Well, in the same way that there are reasonable people that are like totally on like, oh yeah, do whatever you are, atheists or whatever. You know, it's like there are people that are born into Christian families that leave the religion and people that are born no, in atheist like families that I come like to Christianity, myself. you know, and there's no way of predicting what's actually going to happen, you know? Um, and looking at it that way, I don't think like being like a nihilist and a existentialist and an 
optimist and a pessimist, like all the ists, yeah. you know, can exist all together, and that's actually the way it's supposed to be. You know. Well, that's definitely the way it is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I like it. You know, I think we, we of course, the variety is beautiful, and I personally have like a, I have a fetish for what people really believe, right? Like I think. Um, growing up in the culture that I did and experiencing some of the more cynical sides of things, um, I am fascinated by people who really believe stuff at the extremes, right? So um, I am deeply in love with uh, hearing people who really believe like the, like, like the religion, right? When someone really believes it, like reading what they write, um, reading them expressing their beliefs, I find that stuff beautiful. Like I said, it's really just like because yeah. I because I hold a more relativistic viewpoint, yeah. like you, right? Like I because I don't ascribe to any one thing, right? I don't when I read like Aquinas or something like that, um, seeing the raw belief and the effort put mm -hmm. into the belief, um, and just seeing how solid it is. That's it's beautiful. It's delicious, but then also just people who believe in grays, like aliens and stuff yeah. like that, and seeing that they just, this is it. I know it's true, you know, and just, I I can't get enough, you yeah. know, seeing people that are just like really hard on their beliefs, because I'm super flexible, right? Like, I think my openness as an artist, like, you pitch me a new idea, basically in 10 seconds, I'm like, I believe you 100%, sure. Yeah. Like, like, I'm in, right? Yeah, like, yeah, I'm right. so raw and wide open to new ideas that I couldn't possibly get Right. really stuck on one thing a lot of the time so right. people who just mm, are in it and that's their full belief I'm like that's oh let me eat it like cake I love it I, I love it. it right it's, it's, it's so good best. yeah yeah and for someone like me it's just yeah like we said it's the spice of life the variety is just delicious definitely draw the line at like you know let, let's say uh, let's say the Spanish Inquisition and suicide yeah. bombings both uh, it's for, gone too far for, at this point. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would say I'd definitely draw the line somewhere far beyond before there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Drinking Kool Aid. Yeah, that's too far. But the, just the, if you're only talking, I can usually get on board with a lot of that stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to get your opinion on something that I've been thinking about. And I've been talking to everyone about this, where I think that um, the way that people treat uh, artists, like art teachers, and going to uh, like traveling from. Europe or Asia or Africa or wherever to go to brainstorm, I think is a very religious experience. You know, in the same way, people will make uh, pilgrimages from thousands of miles away to go to brainstorm because they feel like they have to learn from the people at these schools. You know, I, I really fundamentally believe that's a very religious experience. Yeah. It's like you're uh, worshiping art. So you go and you feel like you have to go and learn the secrets of art from these people that you perceive as masters, you know. Um, I don't know if that's a correct or incorrect way of looking at things, but I believe, I think it's right, you know? Yeah, well, I think, you know, if we do some definition of, if we do some definition of terms, as always, like, if we're talking religious in the sense of, like, peak experiences, yeah. for sure, right? Like, I would absolutely agree. Yeah. But, um, people, peak experiences are, like, that's something that drives everybody, right? You someone who went all the way from Africa to LA to go to brainstorm is probably because they had some sort of art peak experience yeah. that maybe they've never had with religion or sex or talking to their dog yeah. in, in the darkness of their own living room as they cover themselves in the blood of other animals. Yeah, that's they're very just, specific. <laughs> they've just never had that yeah. other yeah. common experience. Right. So um, they maybe saw a painting right. that just like peak experience, yeah. energy, flooding, adrenaline, wait what what the fuck uh, or i think more commonly it's a mix of that and then most artists seem to have the peak experiences conditioned by they attempted right. to make art and just one little thing went right yeah and then the act of self-creation is so powerful that i think a lot of people experience that as a peak experience a rush of energy throw the pencil down on the paper like that's something from nothing man yeah, i did that right yeah there's yeah. very few other things like that in life and so we chase our peak experiences, right? Like, I meditate. I don't do it because I think it's true. Yeah. I do it because I have had peak experiences meditating. Yeah. And that's why I do it. You know, yeah. it's not, I'm not interested in the, I, I, I haven't had peak experiences watching Pat Robinson on the 700 Club, right? right? So I don't fucking care, right? right? I don't gravitate towards it. Yeah. We go towards what our peak experiences have conditioned us for, I right. think, a lot of the time. So 
in that sense of religious, I absolutely agree. Absolutely, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I always try to disclaimer this because, like I said, I come from a background that's much more yep. fundamental. So when I hear religious, I think of like real, like when I ask, when you ask those people, what does religious mean? They mean like, there's no wishy-washiness here, right? It's right. this person is God yeah. and it means this, this, and this. And if you're not talking about that, that's not religion, right? right. So obviously it's not art, right? Mm -hmm. So. I, I know you get that. I just like to disclaimer when I'm talking to I publics. Like, I understand that, that that is a totally different right. definition definition of terms for what religiosity means. Right. But on your side of things, peak experiences, which feel like spiritual experiences a lot of the time, yeah, I think art is definitely experienced that way well, by a lot of people. And yes, moving to engage with it more and you know the analogs with a teacher or an institution being a guru ashram or something right. like that or they're one-to-one -one, basically it's it's the same exact thing i think yeah and it's like the way i see people talk about kim jong Yi or any of like the modern living teachers yeah, online. he's performing miracles you know and it, it's uh, like they'll talk about him like he's like he's a saint or like a prophet or something you know it's like oh kim jong Yi do like think about like how did kim jong Yi train oh he trains he draws all the time he draws you know it's like in the same way a priest would talk about like oh do your 50 hail marys you know instead of like you know, I was talking to Matt about this. It's like, uh, you know, uh, his version of doing do your Hail Marys is do your 100 heads. You know? yeah. yeah. And it's like same exact thing. It's like people will talk about Scott Robertson in his book in the same way people will talk about like a story in the Bible, I think. Yeah. Or a story in uh, the Quran or yeah, something. Yeah, well, it, it seems that we, we have a structure for ritualizing things that we like to just, we like to put everything into that shape. Yeah. You know, it's like this archetypal shape for what is ceremonial and what is ritualized and what is important. Right. And we do it everywhere. Absolutely. Um, Either by some some psychological thing or just some matter of convenience by the way things naturally structure themselves, who knows? But it does seem that that propagates everywhere. Absolutely. It's over and over again. Yeah. I personally am a, I personally am a syncretist. Like, I, at my core, I feel like everything is everything else. Yeah. That's a, uh, if I look at my metaphysic all the way down to the core, um, the first thing that I experienced that with was drawing, right? I was like, oh, I started, I started getting better at drawing and I was like, oh, it's the same thing as the way people talk about music. It's the same way people talk about acting. It's the same way people talk about dancing. Probably all the arts are the same, mm -hmm. right? And they have underlying principles. The principles of design, for example, like rhythm and emphasis and variety, economy, all of those things are relevant in all of the artistic disciplines, right? So I started there and I was like, oh, all the arts are secretly the same thing. And there's something underneath them, connecting them. And then I experienced more of life and I was like, oh, relationships are that way. Oh, life is that way. Oh, the way that you handle your psychology is that way. Oh, the things that you're interested are in that way. So then it was like, oh no, everything's like that. The syncretism was continuing. Everything was blending into everything else. Um, and so I'm not surprised at all by that connection between the way people pursue art and religiosity, right? Because, yeah, like I said, as a secretist, do you think everything is secretly everything else? You know, you might think of that also as a monism, right? The philosophical idea that there's only one thing going on. And people have proposed different things for what that one thing is right. all throughout the history of philosophy. But, you know, it's my bias, it's my prejudice, but that's kind of where I personally land. So, you know, any, you know, on some deep level, if you're like, doesn't it seem like this is secretly that? I'd be like, yeah, fuck yeah. Everything is secretly <laughs> everything, everything is else. The same. It, it, it's yeah. like that. I mean, when you, like, all a drawing is, is a series of correct decisions. Yep. A very, like, a million correct decisions. Or well, what you feel are correct decisions. It, it, yeah, I could. You experience prefer. as correct. When it's like, that's only, be, like, why is a beginner less correct than a master? You know, somebody who's been doing it for 30 years. And the answer is, they're not. It's not better or worse, you know. Um, it's, it's all subjective. It really is. And um, it might even be. It really might be even be. It might even be transpersonal. It might yeah. be. It might be different than subjective. Right. I, mean, uh, I always ask myself, and I, I say this in my videos pretty often, but when you put down a line, right, you can always be the feeling of correctness, right? You throw a line or you put down a patch in a drawing, and it feels right, right? It either feels like fuck yes or hell no, right? Yeah. And you kind of guide yourself by, you're looking for fuck yes over and over again and you're correcting for hell no, hell no. But if you ask yourself, what, how, where does it come from? Right. Why, 
fuck yes and why hell no, right? If you break it down deep enough, it's you can't account for it. Yeah. Right? It really does subjectively seem basically random right. because the things that are conditioning it, the things that are conditioning it are so subtle and in your subconscious and yeah. so determined by you know the flap of a butterfly's wing somewhere else that it's basically a mystery to you, yeah. right? To you it is subjectively mysterious. You experience it as fuck yes or hell no, but the reasoning for that right. is utterly subjectively mysterious. So it, and when I interpret that, some people can just look at that as ultra personal, right? I interpret it as like transpersonal. Like it really has moved beyond what is subjective because I'm not, it's not really, I don't have agency over it, right? I cannot, all right, if you're confused by everything that I said, I would invite you to do this exercise to the listener. Next time that you're drawing, do this exercise. Look for a moment, be mindful while you draw, wait for a moment where you experience that line or that patch as fuck yes or hell no, yeah. right? And if you if you think you get that and that you know why that is or, or, or that it's from you, just try to switch it, right? Try to say, all right, I wanna make this fuck yes be a hell no or make this hell no be a fuck yes, right? right. You, you can't, yeah. right? You really can't, so you don't get to choose what you believe about that thing or not. And then if it, it's so solid, right? Now you're finding, oh, it's really rigid, right? I actually can't, I can't lie to myself. You can't tell yourself two plus two is six, yeah. right? You can say words like, no, it's six, but you obviously don't really believe it deep right. down, right? Everybody believes two plus two is four, unless you're having a psychotic break. Um, everybody believes two plus two is four. You're gonna feel that fuck yes is a fuck yes. You're gonna feel that hell no is a hell no. Yeah. So you think it's solid, right? So if it's solid, what's the reason? really try to offer them, really try to break them out with as much specificity as you can. And you find that all you can offer, most people can offer, is uh, rules that you didn't pick for yourself. Just shit you heard other people say, things that you've seen elsewhere. It's just everything but you, right? right? It's always everything but you. Right. Again, if it was you, you could switch it, yeah. but you can't. It's everything but you. So yeah. it really moves beyond subjectivity as far as I'm concerned, Yeah. which is, it's, 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 it's scary. It's complicated. Yeah. And I think all this stuff relates to, like, um, I used to not understand the importance of the circle exercises and the line exercises, and that's pretty much all I do now. You know, that's, I love doing that stuff. And it's like, when you think about what an artist is, like, Norman Rockwell and Kim Jong-gi, like, all, like, again, all the famous artists, the act of what they're doing is the same thing as somebody else on a satique, just, like, moving their hand, putting down brush strokes, you know? The act of it is actually very mundane, very boring, you know? Yeah. Laying down a core shadow, if you're you or if you're Norman Rockwell, is the same exact kind of thinking, you know? Yeah. And it's like, when you think of that, it's like um, all a master work painting is, it's like uh, one of Norman Rockwell paintings is just a series of hell yeses, right? And it's just a series of him, like, just at, at a canvas, like, okay. You know, and it's like, it's strange how we can, uh, like all a painting is, is a representation of all of those correct decisions. And it's, in, in a sense, it's their values. Like it's um, like a, a person- In a sense. In a sense. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously there's the effort side of it, but somebody will put in as much effort or more effort than Norman Rockwell and get way less accolades. Yep, yep. You know, and it's like, when you really think about it, it's like Norman Rockwell wasn't rewarded based on how good of a painter he was. He was rewarded based on what he valued, more so than anything else. And it's like, again, going back to the idea of it's really important to pay attention to what your values are, because that's de that's, that determines who you are, you know? That determines what you really care about. And people, more so than anything with art, resonate with honesty. They resonate with the things that are truly speaking to a soul, like speaking to your soul, you know? Um, and again, just scrolling through ArtStation is strange because it's like, you get to see what somebody values. If they did it in, di in digital or if they drew it out in pencil or whatever else, yeah. just the medium and the way they posted it, the time they posted it, the fact that they're posting an art station says so much about who they are, yeah. you know? It um, trails a whole litany of causal actions and yeah. causal thoughts behind it just being there at all. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. just the act of posting on Instagram or ArtStation is actually part of the presentation of the artwork. That's part yeah. of the artwork itself. And know? it betrays a lot about the person. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, I think we should be clear here that it's not, I, I'm assuming you agree that it's not that one value is better than another, right? right? It's like, it's a perfectly valid value to want to hit the type, yeah. to want to fit in with a particular industry, 
yeah. or to be amongst a community that does this kind of thing, right? That is a perfectly good value. It's going to start pissing rain. Hell yeah, dude. Now. It's going to be sick. Um, uh, that is a perfectly valid value. The only question, at least I as a, as a teacher, right, uh, to whatever capacity I am at, my, the thing that I want to be able to remember is anything is a perfectly valid value. It's yeah. just how aware are you that you chose it? Yeah. Did you just wind up getting pushed into it? Like we said, it's just someone handed it to you. Yeah. You never even analyzed it. Or have you sort of with wisdom and with thoughtfulness right. realized what this says about you, what the conditioning factors are, what this implies about uh, your values, right. right? Like, are you doing something you actually don't give a shit about, right? right? Like, and why are you doing that if you don't care about it? Just have you thoughtfully looked at that and made a decision, a thoughtful, informed decision with all of that information on it, right? Because it's amazing how many people will go years literally never having thought about it. Yeah. And you say it to them and they're like, oh, shit, what? <laughs> well, and I guess the level of nuance is crazy on how deep it goes. It's like the level of pressure that you use for applying a midtone in a drawing is part of the artwork. It's part of your values, you know? Mm -hmm. Or it's like a, the... Uh, just the kind of person that you are, for example. Yeah, yeah like, like this is just the way, you do, the way you draw a line. I have right? personal experience with this because a problem when I was coming up, when I was trying to improve my skills, was that I'm very light-handed. Yeah. And honestly, it's almost like timidity. And I had to, and I still have to constantly remind myself to press a little harder than you think you should, yeah. right? And as I got older, I was like, oh, shit, this is always, like, whenever I think something's broken in the house or not working, uh, I'll be like, Deirdre, can you try to fix this, yeah. right? Um, and she'll come over and she'll just fix it. And it's almost always become she's less timid than I am. Yeah. She'll fix it by just like, pulling it harder, pressing it together harder. And I've been, it's been born out of my life over and over again that I'm just like, I'm a little afraid to break it. I'm yeah. a little afraid. And when I think I'm pushing hard, I'm not. I'm just right. like, oh, don't break the thing that I'm trying to fix, something like that. Same in drawing, same in fixing stuff around the house, and same with relationships. And, it's just that's the kind of person that I am. Right. And yes, it could be coincidence, right? But I really don't think it is. Like, yeah. it is. I, like I said, I think it's a synchronous. I'm not surprised that I'm timid in my friendships right. and also timid in how hard I'll press on the paper, right? It makes perfect sense to me that those things are almost one to one. So I have to remember that things can probably bear a little bit more than I'm inclined to think right. moment to moment. Shit's great. Yeah, yeah, and again, it, it's that level of nuance is completely insane. It, it's like it's not just about the images that you like and don't like. It's about the lines and the amount of pressure per stroke and the amount. Like it's crazy how much meaning and how much again nuance there is in all this stuff. You know, um, and again, I think the importance. Of, I think drawing circles and lines is the most important thing you could do because you're like, in a sense, finding out who you are on a very fundamental level. You know, yeah. you're just like well, the fact that you're willing to do it at all. Yeah, yeah. entertain it. Yeah, I would do a lot about. Absolutely. Because there's um, plenty of people who won't. They'll hear them and be like, fuck that. They'll no, never think about it again, right? Well, they, they, they're like, oh, I, I don't want to draw circles. I'm just going to go straight to doing full on illustrations, yeah. you know? And then they lose out on that actual painting itself, you know? It's like if you can't enjoy the act of just drawing a line, how can you ever expect to enjoy the act of doing an illustration, you know? Well, I, I would still say it does still, again, the nuance, the nuance layers forever because there's certain temperaments who they can. You know, they 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 will. They're just a circle isn't anything. But then, if they're drawing content, stuff right. they care about, yeah. then they're like, oh, now I'm into it. And right. that, that's always going to be their gateway. Yeah. So, which again, I suffer from this constantly, right? When when you think through this stuff and you see how nuanced it is, you're trying to teach people art. You're trying to teach people art. It is insane to think you can offer blanket advice, yeah. right? Once you start seeing how utterly specific it is to a person's temperament, you kind of got to throw up your hands. And it's hard. Very, yeah, yeah, it's very hard to give blanket advice, which I think is, I mean, I've always gravitated towards one-on-one, -on -one, you know, do workshops, talk to students in class, and um, I, give pe I give different people radically different advice. Yeah. And, it's because I'm just trying to make specific evaluations from individual to individual. Because right. years of experience have just shown that that's really what it's about. Everybody needs something different because everyone's a very different person. And art is just so fucking personal a lot of the time that you really can't give blanket advice to most people. You really you can't. And, and again, it's like you're, you're giving advice fundamentally just based on what they value. 
you know? Mm-hmm. It's like whether, like, whether they like uh, Snickers or Twix plays yeah. into the advice that you give. Yeah, you know? people hey, want to think that's not true, but yeah, yeah. it definitely d- is involved. Right. It absolutely is involved. Right. Um, it is very strange. Um, How are we on time? It is 5.11 right now. How long have we been before? Uh, I can check. Um, we, uh, the rain is making me think we should probably wrap it up. <laughs> uh, I am I'm fine wrapping it up. Okay. Um, I, I, again, oh, wow, I, I really soaked that baby through. I'm so sorry, man. Look I, at that. I appreciate you doing this. I, That's all right. I, I think it's, it is much cooler than it was outside now. Well, yeah, because it's about to... The humidity has stopped because it's all going into the rain. Um, what, I, do you, what do you think? Should we wrap it and head back to the apartment? I'm enjoying our conversation. Right? Oh, it's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, let's go for as long as we feel, and then when it becomes unbearable, let's let's decide to, to wrap it up. Um, yeah, yeah, I can feel See, there's some water. Ooh. It's going to be... Un- I'll tell you, knowing me, it'll be unbearable once I can see the rain. Right okay. now, I can't. Okay. So I'm good right now. Okay, cool. The, well, the thunder is ominous, though. Um, well, I, do you believe in ghosts or what? No. Neither do I. No. Okay. I think it's I think it's bullshit. Yeah, me too. Um, I don't buy it. Well, I would love to see a ghost because it would make me believe in something. Yeah. It would really give me a well, lot. No, I, of I, I, I feel like my people will might disagree with me on this, but I think people who believe in ghosts are looking for too much of a sign from God. You know. I think that there's like. It's almost selfish to believe that you're that important, you know. That that unless you think ghosts are impersonal, they're not a sign from God. They're just um, around. Well, I, I think it's like to to say that humanity is that important. Yeah. You know, it's like a. Um, I don't know. It, there have been 108 billion people. You know. Yeah. Where the fuck are they? Um, I, was, I was at Pompeii what two weeks ago, and yeah. I was like, if there was going to be ghosts anywhere. It'd be here. Yeah, yeah. Right, <laughs> There's right. like a, a resounding civilization that got snuffed out like that by a volcano. Right. There's going to be ghosts anywhere. They'd be a Pompeii. There's mm-hmm. no ghosts as far as I can. It might have been too hot for them. Right. It could have been too hot. Yeah. Well, I feel like the idea of ghosts, it's like it, it distracts you from like the uh, real meaning of what all that stuff is supposed to be. You know, it's like a. Um, it just. it When somebody says ghost it, it strikes something in me that it kind of makes me feel gross you know yeah. it makes me feel like no you're wrong you know I can't explain why but it's like a deep fundamental like I just don't I just don't buy it you know I'm right there with you okay, I'm, I'm, we can hear the rain now we're one step closer to seeing it yeah sometimes you meet people you know I I've I've been very uncompelled by most ghost stories yeah. I've ever heard, right? Like, even when people get really emotional and they're like, this is definitely a ghost, I'm like, I could imagine about a billion other explanations. Yeah, I know that. A ghost, often a large rat would account for a lot of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, right. Um, but, um, it, you know, I and there are people that I generally believe about most things, you know? Right. Um, it does, I do think the world is a mystery. Right? I definitely think the world is so deeply mysterious that a lot is possible, but right. I've never heard of very personal. Well, it's, it's the same reason I don't believe in aliens. Not, at least not yet, because it, it, it doesn't... Like, That's a good way to put it, not yet. Well, and it's like, um, it's because it, it's a useless thought, I think. It's like me believing in aliens. If aliens existed, it wouldn't change the stuff that I'm doing right now at all, you know? Yeah. Same way if I believed in ghosts, it wouldn't change the way that I live my life. It's if, like, if if we had proof that aliens were real right okay, now, I, I can see the rain now. All right, then we just need to finish our alien run, okay, which yeah. could be a whole other podcast. <laughs> I'm horrified of aliens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but if if we knew aliens were real right now, yep. the main result of my life would be that I would wish I had more time to think about aliens. Yeah. But I would have to spend just as much time doing everything else yeah, as yeah. I needed Absolutely. to. So, and I already feel like I'm out of time. Right. So, it would um, take fun. Up because now I can I, see. I'm, I'm oh, actually, it's coming down sideways. Let's I'm, do it, brother. I'm beginning to get wet. Yeah, let's get out of here. Let's see. I'll close this for now. Thank you for having me. Oh, uh, is now that anything? spiked the audio? Oh, okay. <laughs> is there anything you'd like to promote, or how should people follow you? Uh, you know, just go to my YouTube. Would yeah. be fine. Yeah, you know, that'll give you updates on workshops and other things that I'm doing and stuff like that. You do have a course on Proco as well. I do. Yeah, hey, I have hey. secrets of shading on Proco. Hell yeah. If you want to know how to? You want to know some basic ideas about shading and the way light works on organic yeah. forms? Check that out. 
that's the most common email I get. How do I do the shading? I made that course because the answer to that was five hours long, and yeah. now it's in a video. So. Nice. Oh, the microphone's getting wet. Okay. Uh, okay. We're, 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 we're going to cut this. Okay. We're good. Bye, bye everybody. Thanks, Stephen. Okay. Bye. My pleasure.